All right, we're going to do a little bit more of a Bible study tonight. And the title of my sermon this evening is Let No Man Deceive You By Any Means. Of course, that comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, especially if you're keeping up with our Bible memory. Uh, you, you probably had just got done memorizing that, that verse. But uh, verse number 3, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. And what I'm going to be preaching on tonight is a, a pretty simple um, point or explanation just on, on the timing of the rapture. And um, this is more geared to help you to be able to show someone maybe kind of quickly um, why we believe what we believe that we believe in a post-tribulation rapture, it's, it's pre-wrath, before God pours out his wrath. Now, I'm going to be throwing these terms out to you, but I'm going to try to explain it as carefully as I can. I didn't realize, I went back and checked that I haven't really, I haven't preached on this subject yet since the church started, so I thought, hey, it's a good time to do so. Now, end times prophecy, obviously there's a lot of different beliefs out there. There's people that believe all kinds of different things, but in our, in our current day that we live in, what seems to have gotten popular among a lot of churches is the teaching of the pre-tribulational rapture. Um, that is what you'll find most commonly taught among Christian churches in general. Now, there is all kinds of varieties of belief, and I'm not going to go into all the different things, but basically what we believe is that Obviously, we're living right now. Jesus Christ died some 2,000 years ago, rose again, ascended up into heaven, which is where he is right now. We are waiting for Jesus Christ to return. It's known as his second coming. Okay, the second coming of Jesus Christ. He's going to come back. And when he comes back, there's going to be a time a little bit before that and a little bit after that where um, just before that, there's going to be some tribulation that people who are believers in Jesus Christ are going to go through some hard times where things are going to get very difficult, very rough. They're going to be suffering a lot more persecutions as Christians have all throughout history, except it's going to be magnified. There's going to be more persecutions than there ever has been up until the point where Jesus Christ comes back. He's going to rescue those that are still alive, those believers who are still alive, who haven't been martyred, who haven't been killed for the name of Christ. He's going to rescue them, and then at that point, that's going to kick off where God starts pouring out his wrath on the earth. So a lot of what you read in the book of Revelation, the scary stuff, right, where the, the moon's turning to blood, and, and there's all these plagues coming down, and fire and brimstone raining down, and all the stuff that you read in the book of Revelation, that takes place, it takes approximately three and a half years for all that to be done before Christ then sets up his kingdom where he reigns and rules here on earth for a thousand years. And those of us believers will, that, you know, we're going to be ruling and reigning with him during that thousand year reign on the earth. When that reign is over, the devil is going to be loosed out of hell where he's, where he's bound for those thousand years. He's going to go out. He's going to deceive the nations. There's still going to be some unsaved people left on the earth during the time of Jesus' reign. And he's going to, going to deceive the, the nations one last time and gather them together to fight against Jesus and fight against the saints. And they're just going to be consumed in, in a moment. And there's not even going to be a fight. And um, basically then that's when... Um, at that, after that, there's going to be, um, you know, the great white throne judgment. There's going to be a new heaven, a new earth, and then rest of eternity. So that's a, a real broad, just kind of nutshell of what we believe. And I'm not going to go through all of the different passages to explain that. I'm just trying to help you get a big picture of what we believe. Now, there is a seven-year period, going back a little bit now, that happens around the return of Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, there's been a lot of confusion about this seven-year period. And the only place you're going to really find the seven-year period as a seven, you know, a, a length of seven is going to be found in the book of Daniel. It's Daniel's 70th week, and it's a week of years. So every, every, um, 
you know, after seven days in a week, and that's where we get the seven year time frame from. And what people have mistakenly done is refer to that seven year period as being known as the tribulation. Now, keep your place here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and flip backwards to Matthew chapter 24. This is an important distinction. And again, what I'm doing tonight, my goal for tonight, is to not turn to lots of different places to prove why what we believe what we believe. The goal is to help somebody who already has some level of Bible knowledge. Not necessarily a brand new believer, but someone who's been taught a certain way for a long time. But for you to kind of show somebody, maybe it'd be at the door, you run into them, they're already saved, you start talking about some other things, you know, you, you, their King James Bible, whatever, all this stuff. And then you want to give them a DVD or something, or you, know, you want to tell them about after the tribulation, talk about these things. Why is this even important? Why am I even preaching this? Well, in times, prophecy is important. Now, it's not the, the most critical doctrine that you have to have down, but the reason why it's important is because these things haven't happened yet. And as I was mentioning this morning, you know, we read from the book of John where Jesus was saying, hey, I told you these things in advance so that you won't be offended. And God gives us information in advance so that we're not taken by surprise. And God warns us and tells us there's going to be this great tribulation. There's going to be these problems so that we can be prepared for it, which is why I'm preaching it tonight. One of the reasons why, why I preach on end times prophecy at all is so that you can be prepared, so that we can all be prepared for what's going to happen in the future 100% for sure. Now, we don't know for sure when exactly it's going to happen. No man knows the day or the hour. But we have been given signs of the times and signs of things that will happen, and they have to happen in a certain order before Jesus Christ could come back. So one of the main points of people who believe in a pre-tribulational rapture, which means that Jesus comes back before there's any problem, before there's any tribulation, they just think that, well, Jesus could just come back right now. Jesus can come back any moment. He could come back tonight, tomorrow morning, in the middle of the night. He could just come back. It just, there's no reason why he can't come back. And that belief is false. It's not a correct uh, doctrine from the scripture. Because Jesus himself gave us a bunch of things that we can be looking for that have to happen first. And we're going to have a very clear verse in, in 2 Thessalonians. We're going to get to that in a minute. But um, let's take a look here at Matthew 24, because the reason why I even turned here originally was to go over tribulation and that term tribulation. And it's going to be foolish to conflate tribulation with God's wrath. They're not the same things. You can't just give them the same definition. Tribulation is not the same as wrath. You can read all throughout the Bible and God's people, God's chosen people, believers, read through the book of Acts. We were reading through some of that this morning, how the disciples and the apostles, they were thrown in prison they were beaten up. They suffered persecutions. And you could read in the epistles, you know, my fellow laborer, my, my, uh, my bondsmen, my fellow, my, you know, my fellow prisoners. And, you know, people were going through these trials and tribulations. This is something that is, that is expressed over and over and over again. Yea, all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. It's going to happen. Persecution, tribulation, these are synonymous terms. They basically mean the same thing. However, God's wrath is a completely different thing. The Bible says in, uh, you know, in John chapter 3, he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son hath not life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. That's referring to someone who doesn't believe in Jesus Christ. God's wrath is resting on him. And what's God's wrath? God's wrath is like hell. That is a stark contrast to a believer going through some hard times on this earth, getting beat up, getting thrown in prison versus suffering in eternity in hell. Big difference there. 
God's wrath is always referring to something extreme. God poured out his wrath on the, on the earth when Noah built the, the ark and God destroyed the world with a flood. That was God's anger, God's wrath just being poured out and destroying, just utter destruction. God's wrath came down from heaven on Sodom and Gomorrah when he completely annihilated and destroyed those cities and just rained fire and brimstone down from heaven and just left them uninhabitable and just completely destroyed them. That's God's wrath. Amen. Persecution is something totally different. Now, this is also why we don't want to refer to a seven-year period in those end times as being the whole thing, as just being the tribulation or the great tribulation. Because while part of that time is tribulation, the other part of that time is wrath. And they, it is a very important distinction. This is not just word games. This is not just semantics. This is something that the more you study your Bible, you will see the clear distinction in terms. And it is important. And you can't just be flippant about the words that you use. So bear with me. I mean, this is a little bit more of a study tonight. This isn't your common, just topical sermon where I'm going to rant and rave about some sin and, and you know, pound my fist and, and get all angry about something that, that people are doing and, and wickedness or whatever. This is helping us all to understand what to expect and what the Bible teaches on this doctrine. Now, um, what I love about Matthew 24 and what I don't understand what's so difficult about this and what you have to be aware of is what theologians will try to do. Beware of anyone who's going to point to the Bible and say, well, I know it says that, but what it really means is whatever. When someone tries to tell you that the Bible means something different than just what you can clearly read that it says, watch out for that guy. I wouldn't trust what they say. Now, of course, there's many deep meanings within Scripture. We can glean a lot of great truths. We can look at something and, and, and see other deeper applications or other meanings. That's great. But you could never reject the surface teaching of what the Bible actually says. And we always need to go with that first. And any deeper meanings or context or anything else you can learn from that should never contradict a surface clear teaching of what the word says. What I love about Matthew chapter 24 is we have a very simple question and answer from Jesus' disciples to Jesus himself. Look at um, verse number three. The Bible says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? What are they asking Jesus about? They're asking about when he's coming back. They're asking about the end of the world. That was their specific question to him. Verse 4, And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. So as he responds to them, he says, Okay, right off from the very beginning, make sure no one tricks you about this. Because there's going to be a lot of people coming up with all kinds of different answers and, and tell you, try to teach you all kinds of different doctrines. Just from the very beginning, make sure no one tricks you about this. And this is one of those doctrines that there is so much false teaching out there on. Yeah, that's right. I mean, it is just in abundance. Right. And we need to take heed to Jesus' word. Take heed that no man deceive you. One way you're going to take heed that no man deceives you is by reading the Bible for yourself and questioning what you hear and not just receiving it. Take a look at the back of your bulletin. I have a place for sermon notes. Okay? And I'm going to bring this up from time to time because it's that important. And I don't care how many times you hear this from me, I'll keep on repeating it because I want you to be able to know the scriptures for yourself and not trust me or anybody else that what I'm saying is true because you're responsible for your own faith. I'm going to do my best to try to teach you everything that I've learned and I'm going to do so in honesty, but at the same time, I may be wrong about something. And if I happen to teach something in error, I would like for you to be able to catch it. <laughs> so 
write down, take notes, especially if it's something you're not settled on or something maybe you haven't heard before. Definitely make sure you look that up um, and, and, and read it later and get the full context. So he's saying here right off the bat, take heed that no man deceive you, deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many, and ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars, see that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So he's basically saying there's a lot of things that are going to happen, there's going to be wars, don't let some big war trouble you, some major war somewhere, there's going to be wars, that's going to happen, that's the way the world works. Verse 7, for nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. We see these things happening today. These are the beginnings of sorrows. This doesn't mean that the tribulation has started yet. This doesn't mean that Jesus is coming back yet. But he did say all these things are going to happen. Okay, and we've seen these things happen. This is, this is part of the world. Verse 9, now he goes on to, Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted, and shall kill you, and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So before Jesus comes back, believers in Christ, disciples of Christ, are going to be afflicted. Being afflicted, that's a form of persecution. That's a form of tribulation. You're going to be, you know, people are going to be killed and you're going to be hated of all nations. All nations. The whole world is going to be against believers in Jesus Christ. Now, is that the case right now? No. All nations are not against the believers. We haven't gotten there yet. It says and then in verse 10, And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for witness unto all nations. And then shall the end come. So we just went through all kinds of things here, first of all, that need to happen. And many of these things are happening or have happened. The Bible says there's just going to be sin is going to increase. And because sin increases, love's going to wax cold. People are going to be less loving. The more sinful life you live, the less loving you are. Makes sense. But then in verse 15, he starts to get real specific here. It says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place, Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. So he makes a reference back to the book of Daniel. I'm not going to go back there. He talks about the abomination of desolation being set up in the temple. And this is an idol that's set up that people begin to worship as God. This is, this is where the Antichrist sets up this idol and um, people begin to receive the mark of the beast and worship this idol. All of these things are being referred to as happening. And Jesus Christ hasn't come back yet. And this, this one thing, though, the abomination of desolation, this is a big piece to the puzzle. This is a major key that you should go back and you could do more studies on this later on and, and see what Daniel talks about that and other things that are going on at that time, okay? But, it, but for our purposes, we're just looking at this. Okay, that happens. And he's talking about them seeing that. This didn't happen in their specific lifetime, so this was written for people, I mean, because he's answering the question, What's it going to be like at the end of the world when he's ready to come back? This is what it's going to be like. He's talking to them. Yeah, they're not going to be there personally, but other believers are. Obviously, God's word is eternal. And this isn't just written specifically for the people he was speaking it to. It's for our admonition and every other believer that's ever lived that's, that's received these words. Uh, it's for all of us. So we can gain wisdom by this. This is what's going to happen. And then verse number 21 says, For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. 
So this is what's known as the Great Tribulation. This is where you get that term from. This is where you get that reference from. Anyone who refers to the Tribulation, you're getting that from Matthew chapter 24. You're not getting that from anywhere else in the Bible. Anyone who wants to call it too old. This is, you know, because we know there's been tribulation, but this is the great tribulation. Well, Matthew 24 is the one that terms it and coins that term, great tribulation. And amen. That's exactly what it says. There's going to be great tribulation. But one, it doesn't say it's last seven years. And two, it's definitely not saying that the great tribulation is starting after Jesus Christ comes back. Because he hasn't come back yet in the chronology that Jesus Christ himself is giving when asked the question, what's it going to be like when you come back? So there's going to be great tribulation and it's going to be so bad. Never been anything like it before. It's unique in the severity and how bad it really is. Which, that could be a little scary. I mean, think about some of the martyrs throughout history that have died for the cause of Christ. They've gone through some very difficult things. You could read in, uh, in the book of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 11. You could read, you know, read the faith chapter, read what many people have gone through, been sawn asunder. They've you know, walked about destitute and sheepskins and goatskins and, you know, and all these different things that people did for the cause of Christ. And it's going to be worse than that. And then it says here in verse 22, And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sakes, those days shall be shortened. Basically, what he's saying is that it's going to be so bad that if God didn't just cut that day short, those days short where the, where the persecution is happening, basically every believer would be wiped out. The enemy, Satan, the Antichrist would go and end up destroying every believer on the earth. But God's going to cut short his time so that he can't get to everybody. Otherwise, he would have done it. So, it says in verse 23, then if any man, and notice, you know, the words then, when, then, then, and he, he's telling this in order. Then this happens, then this happens, then this happens. You're not jumping around. This isn't anything. I mean, when you read through the book of Matthew, you're reading it chronologically. No one's saying, well, this happens over here and this happens over here. And, it's, you know, it's the record of Jesus Christ's life and ministry, and it's going from start to finish. And Jesus is giving this account of what's going to happen in the end times. He's not, he, he said, don't let anyone deceive you. Now he's not going to start saying, well, and then this happens over here, and this happens over here, and I'm not, we're going to tell you that this is all out of sequence, but you just have to figure it out for yourself. Why would he say, don't let anyone deceive you, and, and give them information like that? He's trying to make it easily understood. He's answering their stinking question, you know? So he said, if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So there is going to be false prophets out there in the end times, during this great tribulation, that are going to be performing miracles. They're going to be so convincing that, he said, if it was possible, even believers would be deceived by it. But because it says, if it were possible, that implies, that means it is not possible. It is impossible to be deceived by these false prophets. Why? Because we have the Spirit of God residing in us that bears witness that we are the children of God. And we hear the voice of the shepherd. And another we will not follow. So, as convincing as some of these miracles might appear, we are going to know that that's not of God. And especially when you're studying and looking at what God's Word says, it won't even be a temptation to think, well, maybe this is Christ. Of course not. We're expecting this to happen. We know that this is going to happen. Verse 25, Behold, I have told you before. Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. Like the Jehovah's Witnesses, right? Oh, Jesus Christ came back, but it was in the watchtower and it was in these secret places and only a couple people saw him. And they... Don't believe him. Because that's not the way he's coming back. Verse 27, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even to the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. 
the point he's making here is that just like if you see a bolt of lightning just go across the sky, I mean, it doesn't matter where you're at. Everyone can see that, right? I mean, you see a bolt of lightning go across the sky. It's going to be the same way when Jesus Christ comes back. You don't have to wait for someone to point you and be like, hey, did you know that Jesus came back and he's over in the desert over there? No. No one will need to tell you because every eye is going to look up and see him. That's going to be the return of Jesus Christ. Everyone's going to be able to see that he's come back. Um, verse number uh, 28, for wheresoever the carcasses, there will the eagles, eagles be gathered together. Verse number 29, and this is key, immediately after the tribulation of those days. So after the tribulation of those days, sounds like the tribulation has ended. After the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. This is another reference. It's a very important, if you're, if you're going to make your own timeline of the sequence of events in, in Bible prophecy, abomination of desolation in verse number 15, that's one place. That's a big point because you could find other references to that. This is another one where you can do your own Bible study and search and find other times where the scripture references the sun, the moon being darkened, stars falling from heaven. This is not something that happens multiple times. This isn't some event that like, oh yeah, that happened, you know, a thousand years ago and it's going to happen again in a thousand years and then it's going to happen again 20 years later. <laughs> the sun being darkened and the moon being turned to blood and stars falling from heaven, this is catastrophic. This happens once. Okay, so when you see that reference in another place, it's talking about the same exact event. That's why, and the same thing with the abomination of desolation. It's not being propped up multiple times. It happens one time. So we can use these as anchor points when we're trying to understand all the various places in Scripture that reference prophecy. So whether you're looking at the book of Daniel, whether you're looking in the book of Ezekiel or Isaiah, or whether you're looking in 1st or 2nd Thessalonians, or whether you're looking in the book of Revelation, wherever you're looking in, Matthew or Mark or Luke, whenever you look at these places that have any reference to any end times events, you can piece them together on some of these anchor points. This all helps to... Um, to build or create a doctrine. Okay, and again, this is, this is kind of a big doctrine and we, there's no way we go through it all tonight. I've already kind of veered away from my original intent, but this is just so important we have to go through this. So um, let's reread verse number 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds of heaven, excuse me, from the four winds, from the one end of heaven to the other. This is the gathering together of God's people unto him. The angels, I mean, they're doing a mass reaping and gathering and collecting. This is what's known in the Bible as the rapture. Now, the word rapture, of course, isn't itself found in Scripture, but the concept is there. So whether you want to call it a gathering together, a, a catching up, right? This, this notion of believers meeting the Lord in the air, okay? There, there's multiple ways to express this. The word rapture is just a word used to describe an event that literally takes place in Scripture. So don't let anyone also try to confuse you or shake your face. Oh, well, the word rapture is not even in the Bible, so there is no rapture. No, the event happens. We see it right here. Okay, you want to use a different term to call this. I don't have a problem with that, ultimately. It's just really easy to refer to it as the rapture because that's what people know and use to refer to this event. So we're gathered together, his elect, his chosen, his children. That's who it's referring to. And um, 
this is the rapture. And notice it happens after the tribulation of those days. So this isn't, there's no way that this event can happen before the tribulation. It happens after. And then after this happens, of course, God ends up sending his wrath. Now, Jesus doesn't go into all the details of what happens after that because they asked him, what's it going to be like when you come back? At your coming. Well, this is what it's going to be like. Have we seen the abomination of desolation set up? No. Well, that alone can tell you Jesus Christ can't come back yet or else Jesus lied to his disciples when they asked him, what's it going to be like when you come back? Amen. And he says that happens first and then all these other things happen and then the, the sun and moon are darkened and then he comes back. So let's go back to 1 Thessalonians. Matthew 24 and 2 Thessalonians are the two places that in my opinion, are the easiest to demonstrate this doctrine to people, especially maybe if you don't have a lot of time, but you want to, to expose them to the, the, pre, or the, the post trib, pre wrath rapture, right? The post tribulation. It's after the tribulation, before God pours out his wrath. That is the timing of the rapture. Because uh, let's face it, I mean, a lot of people are interested in the subject. It's an interesting conversation to have with. with other believers and it's an important one we ought we ought to be ready for this so let's now look at second thessalonians and the reason why we start with chapter one is because i want to get in context what we're talking about here because people who believe differently are always trying to manipulate words and trying to say they mean different things and it's that's not what that's talking about and this is a different thing and that's a different event and this is something else but when you get it all in context, it's, it's pretty clear to see what we're talking about. So let's start reading here in verse number three. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you all toward each other aboundeth, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endure. Which again, a, another reference to tribulations. Believers going through tribulations. And this is just in passing. This isn't talking about the great tribulation. This is just referring to the tribulations they're already going through. So for someone to say, oh, well, God's not going to put his people through tribulation or the great tribulation. His people have been going through tribulations all throughout history. It's just going to get ramped up a little bit. No reason to think that that's odd. But anyways, let's keep reading. Verse number five, which is a manifest token of the righteous judgment of God, that ye may be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which ye also suffer. And in fact, what he's saying here is that the fact that you're going through these tribulations is, is basically a blessing. This is just showing that you're counted worthy of the kingdom of God, which is why you're suffering for it. Just like we, this morning's sermon, they rejoiced that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the cause of Christ when they were persecuted. When they were beaten and thrown in prison, they thought that was a great thing because they were counted worthy to suffer shame. The Apostle Paul is basically reflecting the same sentiment to the people in Thessalonica. Hey, you're, you've suffered and gone through persecution. This is just demonstrating that God has shown that you're worthy of going through this. So going through a tribulation, and I think going through great tribulation, is an exciting time. Now, it's not something on one hand that you want to go through. Nobody wants to experience pain and suffering and persecution, right? Nobody is that uh, sadistic or what, you know, you, you always want to, well, maybe there are some people, I don't know. I'm not like that. <laughs> I'm not one of those people. Okay, I don't enjoy just suffering, but at the same time, we can take comfort knowing that if we do end up going through that, hey, God can, can see us to be worthy to go through such great tribulation for his name's sake. And that's something that we ought to rejoice over and ought to be happy about if we happen to be alive during this time where right before Jesus comes back and experiences great tribulation. 
Verse number six, seeing it is a righteous thing with God to recompense tribulation to them that trouble you. And to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. So now what he's saying is that you, you who are troubled right now, who are being afflicted and persecuted, you can rest with us. You can take comfort knowing that when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, and this is the context, is why we're going over chapter one, because he's already referring to the return of Jesus Christ, that when he comes back, when he's revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, because what do the angels do? They reap, they gather together the elect, right? That's what he's talking about here. When he's revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. Flaming fire, vengeance, that's God's wrath. They're being rescued, the believers are. They could take comfort because he's there to rescue them and at the same time pour out wrath and vengeance on the, the unbelieving world that have been persecuting the believers. So it says here in verse 8, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. This is wrath. This is not just tribulation, that's wrath. Everlasting destruction. Verse number 10, when he shall come to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe, because our testimony among you was believed in that day. Wherefore also we pray always for you that our God would count you worthy of this calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power, that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now we're going to keep reading into chapter 2. And mind you, when the Bible was written, when these epistles were written, he didn't subdivide it into chapters. This is cont a continual letter to the people. It's easy for us to use the chapters. It's great for reference and stuff like that. But this continues. So we started in chapter 1 to give you the context that he's already referring to the return of Jesus Christ. That is the context of the passage. He's coming back. He continues on into chapter 2, verse number 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. We're still talking about the same thing. He's coming back and he's gathering us unto him. Another reference to the rapture. Verse 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us as that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. Now, doesn't this sound very familiar with what Jesus was teaching his disciples? Take heed that no man deceive you in reference to the coming of Jesus Christ. Let no man deceive you by any means. And he said, I don't want you to be troubled. I don't want you to be shaken. If you hear, even if someone sent a letter as if it's coming from us. Oh, this is sent by the apostle Paul. Jesus Christ is coming back. He's in the desert. He's saying, no, don't let anyone trouble you. And when it says here, as that the day of Christ is at hand, at hand means this is about to happen like right now. I mean, it's the day of Christ. It's the day of Christ is at hand. If I were to say that right now, it'd be like, it's here, it's upon us. It's just, it's, it's right here. Don't let anyone deceive you. But what are people saying that believe in a pre-tribulational rapture? Hey, the day of Christ is at hand. I mean, it could happen right now. It could happen today. It's upon us. Well, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 says, Well, let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come. Except. Except means there's a condition. So in order for that day to come, in order for the day of Jesus Christ to come, in order for the day of Christ, in order for his return, in order for our gathering together unto him, which was all mentioned previously, in order for that day to come, it says, shall not come except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Has the son of perdition been revealed yet? No. You know when he becomes revealed? I'll give you a hint. 
We already saw in Matthew 24 when the abomination of desolation is set up in the temple. You know what? That's when you know that the, the, the son of perdition because when you read Daniel, you'll see that that's who it's referring to with the abomination of desolation being set up. And it, I mean, this all fits together. Do the study, please do the study on your own because it's, it's really fascinating stuff how the scripture just fits together so perfectly. So perfectly. You don't have to jump through any hoops to try to get this doctrine to fit. I mean, you're, you literally are just seeing the same thing over and over again in Revelation, in Matthew, in Thessalonians, in Daniel. It doesn't matter where you are. They all line up with each other without having to move things all over the place. It fits. So what's he going to do? The son of perdition, verse number four, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. This is what I was referring to this morning. This is what Satan wants to do. This is his agenda. He wants to create this temple. He wants to sit in the temple and he wants to be the one that says, I'm God. And notice it says here, showing himself that he is God. He's not even doing it for anyone else. He wants to show himself. I'm God. He's so full of pride and full of himself. He just wants to have this, see, I'm God. And have the people worship and everything else. It's all about him. Verse number five. Remember ye not that when I was wet w yet with you, I told you these things. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. So he's saying, now you know. He said, don't let anyone deceive you because that day shall not come except the man of sin be revealed. And then he, and he finishes up saying, and now you know. Okay? Now you shouldn't be deceived. Now you know what withholdeth. What's withholding? What's withholding Jesus Christ coming back? The man of sin being revealed. The son of perdition. That's what withholds it. That's what's preventing that day from happening first. That's why Jesus Christ can't come back at every, any moment right now. Because the son of perdition hasn't been revealed. Verse number seven, it says, uh, For the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he who now letteth will let, until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, I'm going to get into as much of this as I can because I kind of sidestep what I was planning on doing a little bit. Um, I want to give more explanation here for this latter portion of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 because this is also twisted around. I'm not sure. I, I, it, I probably won't have enough time to get to this, but what I wanted to do is just to try to help you to answer any objections from people who believe differently about this who want to tell you, oh no, this is all different. All of these different things, this is all talking about different stuff than the rapture. They want to pick and choose what pertains to rapture and what doesn't. If it lines up with what their doctrine says, then they like that. But then when you go two verses later, oh no, that's not talking about the rapture anymore. This is talking about something else. Even, I mean, even just the term the Great Tribulation, they, you know, well, that comes from Matthew 24. Oh yeah, but that's just talking about the Jews. Well, wait a minute, then where are you getting your term from? Well, it's the tribulation. Well, we get that from Daniel. But this is talking about Daniel. Yeah, but this is talking about the Jews. <laughs> Don't feel stupid. And so many people I've talked to have been like, man, you know, I kind of stayed away from Bible prophecy because any time it's been explained in a pre-tribulational sense, I just felt really dumb. I just couldn't understand it. And, and I felt like, well, maybe they're just much more spiritual than I am. I just need to learn more. I need to grow more because I just simply can't understand this. It's way beyond me. It's not because you're dumb. It's not because you're spiritually not mature. It's because it literally doesn't make sense. It's because it's not in Scripture. 
That's why it doesn't make sense. That's why it's so hard. And when someone comes at you with these doctrines, it's just so hard to figure out and understand. It's probably not true. Because nothing should be that difficult to just understand. God is not trying to just confuse everybody and confuse believers and confuse people who are trying to follow him with, with the way that, that God's word is written. It's made plain. It's, it's made plain for the, for the common man to be able to understand so that you don't need some other person to decipher it for you. What I'm teaching tonight, any one of you could have come up through your own Bible reading and the Holy Spirit guiding you. Anybody can. I am not doing any manipulation and so, well, see, in order to understand this, you have to go here. It's literally just what the passage says. I just happen to know where other references are that are already in the text and being referenced. I'm not, I'm not giving you some hidden reference that you wouldn't be able to see unless I point it out to you. Well, when it says that Daniel speaketh of, <laughs> that's, a, that's a pretty easy point to say, okay, there's a reference. Right, I, I didn't just, it's, it's not my theology degree that allows me to be able to see that because I don't have one. But um, <laughs> in any case, let's, let's get back here. One of the things that people might try to uh, say about 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, even though we see the context that it's referring to, um, you know, that day where the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, our gathering together unto him, they'll say uh, that you be not soon shaken in mind, in verse 2, or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word, letter, nor by word nor by letter is from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. And they'll say, see, the day of Christ, that's something different. That's not the same as the second coming. That's the day of Christ. Right? And then they'll say that's different than the day of the Lord, and then they'll say it's different than all these other things. Now, I'm going to do a study with you in the day of Christ versus the day of the Lord, I believe they are two different events, but they happen on the same day. It's basically two different perspectives of, of essentially the same event. But as far as timelines concerned, they happen at the same, the same day or the same time. Day of Christ, and just briefly, we'll, we'll go over this in a, in a full study. The day of Christ is just what believers are looking for Christ. And that's going to be a glorious event. That's going to be something good because believers... When, before Christ comes back, we're going through some real hard times. So we're going to be looking for our Savior and be like, thank you, Jesus, for coming back to save us out of this. If you're still alive and remain while all the tribulation's going on and you see him come back, you're going to say, hallelujah, I made it. Amen. And he's saving me out of this persecution and this tribulation. Praise God. And you're going to go meet the Lord in the air. That's a joyous occasion. But you know, for the people who are doing the persecuting and they look up and they go, oh, uh-oh. The ones who are out actively trying to kill you and they look up. Oh, that's not a happy day. Oh, happy day. <laughs> not for them. That's when they're going to be running to the, to the dens and the caves and rocks, crawling the rocks, fall on us from the face of the lamb. Why? Because the day of his wrath has come. That's what they're going to be doing. They want to hide because you better believe God's going to be angry at the people who are killing his people, killing his children, murdering them, persecuting them. And he comes to pour out that wrath. There's a few mentions of the day of Christ, but what you'll notice is that in no way does the, is there any reference or evidence that this is referring to a different event other than the gathering together unto him. And there's only a few times this phrase is used. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse number 7, the Bible reads, So that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall also confirm you unto the end, that ye may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. So, there's the reference of the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, the day of our Lord Jesus Christ being the same event. I mean, it's two verses. 
And they're referring to the same thing just as much in the same context here, referring to the same thing. Philippians 1.6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. When you get saved, God begun a good work in you. He says that work's going to continue until the day of Jesus Christ. Is there anything saying there inherently that that's different, a different day than when Jesus Christ comes back? No. There's nothing to say otherwise. We already have two passages referring to the day of Christ and tying it in with his coming. This doesn't say anything any different. Philippians 2, verse 16 says, Holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. And again, this is talking about an ending, if you will, right? The, kind of the, the, the making it to the end of this race or whatever. I haven't run in vain, neither labored in vain when the day of Christ happens. Nothing to suppose otherwise. So if someone wants to tell you that, oh, the day of Christ is something different, so that's why you can't apply 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it holds no water, not in Scripture. And I'm going to close with this. I, I, I've got a lot more. I was going to tie in Revelation chapter 13 with um, the wicked being revealed. And he, you know what, I'll, I'll just, I'll quickly go over this without giving you all the details on it. And you can study it out for yourself in Revelation chapter 13. The he who now letteth will let. Okay, granted, this is not the easiest sentence to understand in the Bible. Okay, and you have to watch out for the sentences like that. Because that's where the false teaching, I mean, people love to pounce on, on these verses and just tell you all kinds of different things. What the pre-trib person will tell you is that, well, the he who now letteth will let is the Holy Spirit until he be taken out of the way. The problem with that is the Holy Spirit is not mentioned at all in 2 Thessalonians. Here, all the way up until this point. So why would the he be the Holy Spirit? You can't just use a pronoun about someone who hasn't even been referenced at all. There's nothing to indicate that the he would be the Holy Ghost other than it's ju they're just trying to make something fit their doctrine. And so when they say, that, well, the Holy Ghost is to be taken out of the way, that's because believers are filled with the Holy Ghost, so that's got to be taken out of the way and all this other stuff. Doesn't hold water. The mystery of iniquity doth already work. He who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. This is talking about the wicked being revealed when um, he that letteth will let is taken out of the way. Now, I'm not saying that I'm 100% right on this, but this is what I believe about this. Okay, And you can study this out for yourself, and if you disagree with me, that's fine. But... My understanding of this passage in this one particular verse does not undo the timing of the rapture whatsoever. I'm just bringing this up to try to give you an explanation of what I think about something that is seen or can be seen as maybe a more, a more difficult passage. In Revelation chapter 13, you're going to see a reference to the beast and the dragon. The dragon is Satan. And the beast is referred to as that wicked. Okay, so when that wicked is revealed, let's just, well, let's just read it real quick. All right. You don't mind, right? Verse number one, Revelation chapter 13. The Bible reads, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. The dragon is the one enduing the beast with power. Satan is the one giving the power unto the beast. And I saw one of his heads, the one of the beast's heads, as it were wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. And they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And, um, and then it goes on and on. I'm not going to read the rest of that. But 
what I think this is referring to, he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. I think that Satan literally possesses the Antichrist, that, that, that deadly wound, because Satan's not able to bring somebody back from the dead, like to perform a resurrection. God's able to give life. God's able to perform that miracle of, of actually giving life. We never have any example in Scripture of anybody other th than through the power of the Holy Ghost be able to raise somebody back from the dead. Even going back to Egypt when, uh, when, when the magicians were trying to mimic what Moses was doing, when Moses brought forth lice, when he brought forth, you know, because that was like a living creature, they weren't able to do that. They couldn't mimic that. When there's anything where like, like that was actually life, like we can't do this, this is the finger of God. Okay. So someone being resurrected or brought back to life, he's not able to do that. But he is able to possess. I mean, we, we know that, that devil possession is real. It's all throughout scripture. So Satan being able to then take over and, and control that person. Now, maybe he doesn't die completely or whatever, but he's so mortally wounded that he's not quite dead yet, but Satan's able to step in. You know, because it says, as it were, wounded to death. He's able to step in there, though, and then make it look like, hey, I'm back, right? Come back from the dead. And maybe he waits three days and three nights. Wouldn't surprise me, trying to be like the Most High, trying to be like God. That's what I think he who now letteth will let. He's, he's not allowing it, because that's what the word let means, he's not allowing it, um, until he be taken out of the way. So the Antichrist, in a sense, he's taken out of the way, and now that wicked is being revealed, possessing him and being worshipped. And um, that's what you see in Revelation 13. And that's, that's the way that I understand these verses. Like I said, I'm not saying that this is the only way that you can read that or understand it. I may be wrong about that. But um, I think that's a much more valid understanding of the passage than just trying to say that that's the Holy Ghost that needs to be taken out of the way when the Holy Ghost isn't even mentioned there when I'm actually referring to something that is in the passage talking about the wicked being revealed and um, you know the son of perdition which has already been referenced in the passage so um, to wrap things up because I, I had a little bit more on these passages I went a little bit more in depth when I was planning to but this is an important doctrine. It's something that, that one, people are interested in, and two, we ought to have a good understanding of for, for the future, for times to come, to be prepared for. The best and most, and, and the reason why I just pretty much stuck with Revelation, or not Revelation, with, with 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and with Matthew 24 is just because it's, it's real clear to dismantle so many presuppositions of the pre-tribulation rapture. And you know what? If someone disagrees with you on this, but they're, they're saved, they're soul winning, everything else, great. You know what? God bless them. It's fine. But if you're a brother in Christ, sister in Christ, we ought to care about them and show them these things. Let them know, hey, this is, you know, you've been deceived. And the Bible says in multiple places, don't let anyone deceive you. This is very clear. This is, this is, this is straightforward from the Bible. And when people, if you could find someone who's willing to listen and talk about it with you, then amen, they'll probably receive this without much of a problem, just because it's so clear. But don't get, I mean, if someone just wants to argue and debate, it's not really worth it. But if, but if you find someone who's humble enough to just, just have a discussion, I encourage you to do so and try to show them. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Matthew 24, you really shouldn't need anything else. Right. Study out those passages. Read, you know, learn what they say. You don't have to get into all the different symbolism that you'll find in the book of Revelation with the, the beasts and the dragon and you know, a lot of the candlesticks or anything else, that anything that you might find in the book of Revelation. I'm not saying Revelation is that hard to understand either, but this is pretty straightforward. So... Um, Hope that helps you. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the, the warnings that you give us in Scripture and the teaching on, on the end times and on everything. Lord, help us to, um, to refine our own understanding. Help us to just be more wise and increase our knowledge, Lord. 
and um, help us to be able to preach the truth and um, unashamedly preach the truth. Lord, help us to reach others. Help us to be humble in our approach to other people who might believe different doctrines or have been deceived by, by teachings of man or of false prophets, Lord, and help us to, um, to just bring honor and glory unto the name of Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen.